welcome to Massive Late Fee. And now your hosts, Mark and Carol. Welcome, everyone, to Massive Late Fee. Uh, my name is Mark. With me, as always, is my girlfriend, Carol. How are you doing, Carol? Hey, what's up? It is April 21st, 1995. We're coming at you with everything we got. Listen to you with all the assurance about the dates. I'm really proud of you. You've been checking the calendar and staying oriented. Yeah, I know. Go you. I've had to. <laughs> I've had to do that now. You know, we don't have to write the date anymore on our papers at school, so yeah. it throws me off sometimes. Yeah. Do you remember when we had to do that, like middle school, early high school, like, you know, do 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 I like the way that the Europeans do the date better. I still do it. Do you? Yeah. No, we don't have to do it anymore. But I like the way the Europeans do it do it better. Instead of saying like April twenty first, nineteen ninety five, they'd say twenty first April nineteen ninety five. Oh, I don't like that. Well, I like it for a couple reasons. One, it's an easy separator. So you write twenty one April nineteen ninety five. <clears throat> You've separated the day from the year with a word. It's a very good grammatical separation, and you're going in order. The smallest unit, the day, the Mm -hmm. next biggest unit, the month, and the biggest unit, the year. Okay. I guess. So I like it a lot. But we don't do that here. No, In the States, (laughs) as they say. No, we do not. Carol, before Mm -hmm. we get into, you know, what we want to talk about, before we get into the TV show that we want to review, and before we get into the movie that we want to gush about, why don't we turn to you because you got a letter that I, you want to read i got two letters oh you got two letters you two letters read. yeah it's very exciting we've been getting several letters and we haven't really read them or i guess uh, email, email how do you say that <laughs> email. email electronic, electronic mail, mail. <laughs> let's just do the whole show like that where we say the same just in sync the entire time <laughs> oh i wish we could that would be we fun. should write a script and just <laughs> oh god no <laughs> Oh, can you An imagine hour we long to script? script. <laughs> and I mean, like, it, no, we have to. What? The, we have to go off the cuff. It wouldn't work. You don't think so? Scripting the show, no. Scripting, it would be funnier, maybe. I don't think so. It'd be less funny, maybe. Exactly. I guess those are the options. So could this, the show be less fun? <laughs> <laughs> okay, uh, Mr. Bing. Yeah. Um. All right. So we got a letter here from Rebecca. Uh huh. Says so, hi. Mar- it's hey. What's up? Yeah. Hey. What's up, mm-hmm. Rebecca? Mm-hmm. Um. Hi, Mark and Carol. My name is Rebecca, and I absolutely love your show. We you- know your name, Rebecca. <laughs> we got it. When you said hi, Rebecca, we know. Uh, don't be mean. No, I'm just. Joking. The two of you are so cute together, and the two of you are so funny. I really appreciate the tapes, and I love hearing about the movies in nine hundred two and zero. But will the mixtapes ever come back? Thanks for everything you do. I really appreciate it, Rebecca. Oh goodness, will the mixtapes ever come back? Yes. No. Yes. Wait, what? Yeah, I mean, it's just like we haven't had the time to do them every week, but we could do like one every once in a while. Like uh, bonus, you know, bonus. You know what's hard about the mixtapes is that so like every week there's a new television show. You know, there's a new episode of a show every right. week. And every week there's a new movie that comes out. Right. At, you know, several usually. Uh, and... Or, you know, and Blockbuster releases every week. Yeah, exactly. But with music, music's more static yeah. than, than everything else. So when we try to do stuff from the, you know, when we try to do like the top 10 or whatever of Billboard, the top Billboard 100, even. <laughs> right. You know, we, we go to like Variety or, or we pick up, you know, we pick up Billboard, the magazine. Yeah. Right? And we look through it and everything. It, a lot, it's the same a lot week to week. If you, Listen to like Casey Kasem on the radio, do the countdown. Uh, you know, he'll, he'll, like, that's usually pretty much the same, too. Yeah. Uh, like, kind of week to week. There'll be a new one that sneaks in every once in a while, and some might move up a little bit and down a little bit, but this, it's usually the same ones for a long period of time. Music just it doesn't work like the rest of entertainment does. So it can get difficult to find new ones when we're doing it every single week. Right, so, which is why we decided to back off a little bit on it, but we'll definitely do it again. Yeah, oh yeah, well, we'll 
It'll be more of a bonus kind of thing, I think, but we'll we'll bring it back yeah. for sure. Maybe like once a, a quarter. Yeah, yeah. Once, once a, a month. Season. Once a month, once every couple once a months. Month, something maybe like that. when, you know, we don't work a bunch and stuff. Okay. Next, we got a, a letter from Nick. Retro Leafy is the best show ever. Mm-hmm. I love your, I love your show so much. I look forward to it every Monday and Tuesday. Uh-huh. I started listening to <clears throat> other things too. Uh, right. So <laughs> did he? So he's renaming the show. I guess that's a good idea. I mean, maybe years from now. Maybe. Anyway, thank you, Nick and Rebecca, so much because yeah. it makes it like actually worth the time and effort we put into it although i'm not putting any effort to edit the show (laughs) this week so you're gonna you know this will be it's all this is raw and (laughs) cut because uh isn't that what makes it the best well my computer has uh has crapped out so i've had i i gotta go back to uh comp usa and get (laughs) another gateway uh computer because it's totally crapped out and uh and yeah so um yeah that's what i use to edit the show it has to be done through computer because we're not on uh you know uh we're not on real to real here right so sorry no editing um i send this i send this through a computer it comes back onto audio tapes and then uh and then those audio tapes get sent out to you guys that's how it works (laughs) right It's the magic of the computer. Um, (laughs) But anyway, we really, really appreciate it. I bet you guys didn't know that computers could make audio tapes. No. But they do. (laughs) This is what life is like in 1995, guys. It's like Oompa Loompas who make candy. Exactly. (laughs) They live in the computer and make audio tapes. Correct. (laughs) You just put the thing in there and then new audio tapes come out. Right. I just got to put the case in there. Some put some plastic in there. Just insert some plastic in the hole and it it, it knits together a, an audio tape with a with a spool. All righty. That's how it works. So, what did we watch this week? Well, we watched uh a very funny show that they they also I assume use computers to make their their audio tapes. Right. Uh news radio. As you insist on saying news radio, but it's news radio. What what the hell is the difference? That's all one word. News radio. Uh, I'll tell you what, though. I'm really glad we watched it because I really liked it. And I got to admit that I was really afraid to watch it because I figured it'd be boring because news radio sounds really boring. Yeah, she thought it was going to be uh, about a new the news. Show. <laughs> I did. It's a hard look at the news <laughs> starring the kids in the halls, Dave Foley. <laughs> Saturday Night Live's uh, Phil Hartman. It was cute. The Ben Stiller Show's Andy Dick. Yeah, that is a lot of comedians. Some guy named Joe. Yeah, and you thought it was a new show. <laughs> well, I didn't look beyond the name. That guy named Joe, uh, Joe Rogan is his name. Rogaine? Rogaine Rogan? Sure. Um. Anyway, he's uh, he's like some kind of comedian, but he's an actor too, obviously. He's got a really unique voice, though. I think he would do well at uh, at making tapes like us. You know, if if we if we inspire uh, a group of other people to mm-hmm. to make tapes with with your own opinions, I know we're the only ones doing this right now on the computer with the magic Oompa Loompas. Right, too, by the way. I, I know we're, I know we're the only ones out here doing this right now, making these tapes. But if other people you know, made uh, tapes like this, then I think uh, I, I think he'd be a good one to do it. I think so too. Because he's got a he's got a very unique voice. Yeah, he does have a nice voice. Yeah. So I don't know the characters very well, so I'm not going to remember anyone's name. Mm-hmm. But um, the main boss guy. The main boss guy. <laughs> and Jimmy the, James. Okay, and the like assistant boss guy. <laughs> Dave, Dave, yeah, Dave Foley. Yeah. So, okay, so Dave has to so Stephen Root and Dave Foley. That's their that's their actor. The actors' okay, names. Stephen real names. and Dave. The sure. Ba- okay. Sure. 
Okay, so Stephen has decided that Dave has to be in charge of employee bonuses. Okay. Yes, yes that's correct. <laughs> that is what happens. And um, it's kind Her of... Her memory's getting better. <laughs> we watched this like two days ago. It's 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 improving. I, I have an amazing memory. It's like a vault, okay? Yeah, I have to remind you of uh, your entire life every couple days. <laughs> Your um. name's Carol. We're <laughs> dating. Right. Anyway, it sucks because he's apparently sleeping with one of the staff. Yeah, it's not apparent. He is. And Lisa. Lisa. Yes. And she expects him She's to give... She's the Mary Tyler Moore character, basically. She expects him to give her the big bonus, which I think is really wrong. <laughs> right? She's already getting the big bonus. Yeah, she is. Um, I assume that I assume that uh, Dave's got an uncircumcised face. Why? With smooth, unseamed balls. I don't want to think about his balls. Why not? Because because he's blonde. She doesn't like blondes. I don't. Anyway, I think he's blonde pubic hair. Oh, <laughs> or white. Nasty. <sighs> Apparently, every year, the big bonus goes to, like, the main star of the show. Bill McNeil. And... The real deal with Bill McNeil. <laughs> That's Phil Hartman's character. He's the one that... He's the, the talent. He does right. the show. Right. Hence why I said the star of the show. Oh, I thought you meant the star of the actual no. show. News radio. No. Oh, I'm sorry. I, I, I did it, too. News radio. And then and then somebody gets the shaft, and it's the same guy every year, so he gets nothing. It's Andy so it's Dick. Like, everybody gets $400, one person gets nothing, and one person gets $3,000. It's motivating. It's terrible. Well, that's what Jimmy James says. It's motivating. Right. But it's terrible. So <laughs> he's in this terrible position where he has to decide. And then throughout the entire episode, they're doing a bit where... <laughs> <laughs> what a weird thing in a comedy show where they're doing keep, a bit <laughs> they keep leaving food on the stars Bill desk McNeil. <laughs> because he's not at it that much you have to know who phil hartman is at least mm, nope wow so yeah <laughs> so he keeps like staring at people through the booth and like running out there and acting all crazy and paranoid but it's it is true. weird like every time anybody looks away they look back there's food or drink on his desk mm-hmm um yeah do you think that do you think that disproves the observer effect or proves it uh (laughs) would you like to stall some more (laughs) i don't remember i can vamp a little bit if you if you want i don't remember which way the observer effect goes the observer effect simply says that the mere act of observing an experiment changes the results. Could be anyway. We don't know that results would be different uh, if there was no one to observe it. Kind of like the if a tree falls in the forest and no one's there to hear it doesn't make a sound kind of thing. Well, he said the reason the guy who was circling his desk didn't put anything on is because he knew he was watching. So Yeah, that's that, it seems to confirm yeah, the observer effect. It does. There's actually a really fascinating novel called Flash Forward uh, that talks about this event where everybody where everybody kind of loses consciousness and during the time that they've lost consciousness like the whole world goes on but everyone in the world has lost consciousness oh weird and video video uh tapes record but nothing's on them which seems to confirm the observer effect huh the fact that no one's there to observe it they don't record anything oh that is very weird yes but it's a really good it's a really good book they should make it into a TV show, I think. It's a really good book. Yeah, I mean, it sounds like it might be okay. Or maybe a movie. It might be better as a movie. I would it's... definitely see the movie. Yeah. So, I mean, that's really mostly the whole episode. There wasn't a lot that happened. Me... Yeah, I mean, yeah. I, yeah, basically. I, he, so he, the the show is built upon, there's not a ton, there's not a big plot to the show. Right. Usually, uh, I mean, we're only like, a few episodes into this show. Uh, but I like it a lot. And I was excited to see it because I like Dave Foley a lot from the kids in the hall. As I mentioned, I like Phil Hartman from Saturday night live. Uh, and I did watch the Ben Stiller show. I like Andy Dick. I think he's a really talented comedian. 
Uh, the other ones I haven't I didn't really know much, but I like them. Uh, you know, the secretary, the redheaded secretary, and uh, Lisa and the Joe guy. Mm. I, I like all them. They seem to work really well together and everything. Yeah. So I was excited for the show, and I, I think it's really funny. But yeah, basically what they seem to do is they have one kind of idea. like a like It's not a fully fleshed out plot. I mean, it's like, so pitch an idea for the show. Uh, Dave has to figure out bonuses. And somebody gets, you know, more money and somebody gets nothing and everyone else gets, you know, a static amount. And that's it. That there's no there's nothing else to that. All the other scenarios and things that happen, they they glom, it's almost like Im- improv. They glom onto that one idea. Right. And it doesn't really branch out the plot doesn't branch out at all from there. And so it can be difficult to talk about the show uh because of that. But yeah, it's it's a really Really well written, uh, funny show. It is funny. Uh, very sharp jokes, and these comedians work really well together. Yeah, uh, and, and and I definitely recommend it. It's it's still new. It's still in its first season. I think this is episode five. Yeah, it's not boring. It's not what it sounds like. Right. It's not. <laughs> it's not a news program. It is funny. So yeah, check it out. Yeah. So that's uh, that's the uh, the show that we watch. But Carol. Yes. Uh, you picked the movie. It did again this week. I know it's going to be your turn next time. Maybe I don't know. We'll see. <laughs> we'll see how good you are. Yep. <laughs> uh, but anyway, so you picked the movie. So you you go ahead and, and tell us what movie we saw and and tell us about it. We saw while you were sleeping, and it was so good. Um, Sandra Bullock from uh, Speed, mm-hmm. and like I don't know the other people's names, but she's like the female star, mm-hmm. and it's insane what happens in this movie. But it's so good. So like she falls in love at first sight with this guy, Peter Jack, Peter Peter, and played um, by Peter Gabriel. Yeah. So she works in a toll booth yeah and every day at the l train yeah and she it's really kind of sad like she lives alone her dad passed away her mom died when she was little she's like totally totally alone yeah the movie starts with like a voiceover for her her, and she's like yeah you know this is all about my dad and he was a great guy my mom died when i was like real real little i don't even remember anything about her and my dad was awesome and now he's dead and what and she's about what a romantic her dad was like that he said that her mom gave him the whole world and it was a globe with a light in it mm-hmm. that she still has. Yeah, and it's funny because, like, it seems like her, her, her dad really was romantic because I guess he never dated or married anybody else. Yeah, that's sad. Yeah. So she, her life's completely empty and she gets a crush on this guy and just looks forward to seeing him every day. Mm-hmm. And she imagines, like, talking to him and stuff, but she never actually does. And then she gets forced to work Christmas, and he apparently was going somewhere and going home. I guess I don't know. Yeah, so taking the L for some reason when he's uh, rich and has a BMW. I don't know why he's taking the L. Anyone that lives in Chicago, you're not taking the L unless you need to take the L. Basically, I mean it's a fine public transport system, but it's not for the rich. It's right. not like New York. Where it's nearly impossible to drive on the streets in Chicago. It's it's busy, but you can drive in Chicago. Yeah. People have cars way more than they do in New York. Yeah, it's kind of weird. But he stops, looks at her for the first time ever. Because you've seen like a montage of him walk past mm-hmm. her without even looking at her so many times. And smiles and says, hey, Merry Christmas. Right. And she can't say anything. She just goes, uh. <laughs> And he's the only one there, so he's waiting for the train, and these guys run up and rob him yeah, and push him on the tracks. So she runs out, jumps on the tracks, and saves him because the train is coming. Yep. That is, that's the setup so far. <laughs> so, you know, I feel like, uh, I don't know, I feel like I've been talking a lot. So? All right. Are you are you trying are you trying to let me talk more so that I don't have to interrupt you? Is that like what's happening? Well, you're given the plot. I don't have any. I haven't thought of any funny things to interrupt you with. 
<laughs> okay. That's how this works. You give the plot of the movie, or one of us gives the plot. The other one interrupts with funny things that they think of. So thanks for calling me out. I haven't thought of anything <laughs> funny to say. But uh-huh, I mean, it's, it's you hard. suck. No. <laughs> it's hard to think of something funny to say when, you know, we're just, yeah, he gets robbed. She goes googly-eyed for him. Okay, so she f- goes with them to the hospital, which I think is kind of weird. It is weird. I guess she, you know, calling an ambulance, sure. But then she abandons her, her work. Right. And it's Christmas. No one else is there, apparently. Right. Because her boss needed to browbeat her into working. Yeah, so how are people getting on the L? I, I don't know. I mean, he, you know, the guy from Herman's Head, her boss. <laughs> he he uh you know he said oh you, you know you're the only one with no family you fucking loser why don't you work on christmas maybe there was like a switch i don't know and that, and that everybody just gets on for free now who knows but she goes with him to the hospital mm-hmm. and then she's like following him and they're like oh no family only and so she stops and just de- de- dejectedly is like oh i was gonna marry him right like she just Says her fantasy out loud, loud for some reason. And a nurse overhears her and thinks that they're engaged and lets her come back to see him. Yeah, it's really weird. Like, it's, it's weird for her to just assume that. Not right. to walk up and be like, hey, that's your fiance? Come, right. Come with me. She was just like, hey, come on, I'll, I'll get you to him. <laughs> so then his whole you family. You weird stalker relationship with this guy. I'll get you to him. <laughs> right? But his whole family shows up. And the nurse says he's her, she's his fiance to the mm-hmm. family. What the fuck? Why is she in their business? I don't know. Yeah, she really. <laughs> she's in the movie for like five minutes and she becomes the movie's plot lord. <laughs> right. She's just like pro- propels the entire thing. So he's in a coma, so he can't correct anybody. Right. And um, his family is super nice and big and overbearing and interesting. And Mm -hmm. um, apparently the grandmother has heart problems and she doesn't want to stress her out. Did you recognize the grandmother? No. She was in the she was the evil grandmother in the movie we did on this show. The ref. Oh, yeah, you're right. Where She's like, uh, you know, my husband and whatever. Yeah. And Dennis Leary goes, uh. Your husband's not uh, not dead, uh, uh, honey. He's hiding. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, she was the evil grandmother in that in that movie. And then you got Peter Boyle, love Peter Boyle, uh, young Frankenstein, uh, several other things as well. But uh, but great uh, great actor Peter Boyle, very funny mm-hmm. guy. So and a smattering of other people I don't really know. Oh, Jack Warden. Like uh, Hollywood legend Jack Warden. He plays Saul, the family friend. Right. So they're all under the assumption now that they are engaged. And they invite her to Christmas. They're like, oh, we couldn't celebrate Christmas. so Because our son, you know, was almost murdered. Right. So we're doing it tonight. Come to the house. And she's like, oh, no, I couldn't. I couldn't. But then she's sitting there trying to have dinner with her cat who won't come to the table. <laughs> Yeah, her cat's like, fuck you, loser. So she changes her mind and goes. And it's really sweet. Like, she's having fun. She's fitting in. They let her sleep on the couch because she drank too much wine, I think, mm-hmm. or something. Like, yeah. I don't know. We've, we should mention, before this happens, she has a moment when the family kind of all leaves, and she sits down at the bedside oh, of yeah. Peter or Gabriel, and she's like, she gives this long speech about how... um. You know, oh, I never, uh, you know, I, I didn't have family and like, you know, your family's so nice. And, and like basically just kind of goes into like, you know, I never even met you. Like confesses everything. Right. And Jack Warden's just kind of standing there behind the glass like, oh, OK. Yeah. yeah I, I, I get I get what's going on here. Saul. And yeah. he weirdly decides to. um To go along yeah. with it. <laughs> He, like, pulls her aside and tells her, like, oh, I know what's going on, but it's okay because I think you're really good for the family. And mm-hmm. Yeah, the family's happier now or whatever. I don't know. Because Peter, who had the coma dude, apparently is kind of an asshole. And estranged from the family. Yeah. He, he hasn't seen them for a year, so now mm-hmm. they feel like they've got him back because they've got her. How lucky did she get, by the way? 
right? that, uh, that she picked the one guy that had a super nice family, but he was such an asshole. He was completely estranged from them, allowing her to be able to tell this lie yeah. un- un- unwittingly and get away with it. And the morning when she wakes up. Oh, she stays the night. So she goes to the Christmas party. Like you said, she's having all the fun and everything. She stays the night there. I assume because it's late and she doesn't want to get a cab or whatever. She took a cab there. I don't think she owns a, a Oh, car. yeah, that's true. Uh, so, you know, she's she sleeps the night there. And while she's asleep, uh, Star, what's his name? Uh, uh, Lone Star from... <laughs> From Spaceballs, Bill uh, Bill Pullman. Okay. Not Bill Paxson, Bill Pullman. Bill Pullman comes in. He plays Jack, the Peter's brother. I assume younger brother? Yeah. I guess. Maybe. They never say. They're who, pretty close in age, I would assume. Yeah, but, yeah. but like a year, maybe, or two. But yeah. So he's suspicious right away. I'm wondering... Like, we talked about, like, maybe he's closer to his brother than the rest of the family is. Or talks to him a little bit more often or something. Because he seems to think that he would know Mm -hmm. if he was engaged. And he's like, that's not not his fiance. Who's this bitch? I don't know her. Because it turns out he actually does have a girl he proposed to. Mm -hmm. Who's married? (laughs) Right? As it turns out. Ashley Bartlett Bacon. Bacon. Yeah, Ashley (laughs) Bartlett Bacon. Good old ABB, (laughs) as we call her on the farm. And, um, okay, so Jack... It's the while you were sleeping far. But, um, Jack asks a lot... Don't, don't ask what happens to the animals on the while you were sleeping far. Wow. We had a, when did you, when did you have, uh, this human cow hybrid? Well, while the cow was Aww. sleeping. Gross. <laughs> Gross. Uh, yeah, okay, go ahead. Jack's asking a lot of questions about her. Like, oh, I mean, he, at first he's like, at first he's like, oh, welcome to the family, whatever. But yeah, he has a ton of questions. Like, he's kind of accusatory of her the whole time. Mm-hmm. Like, um, yeah, at some point, sorry, things are getting jumbly now. <laughs> okay. So she, she's the, they, they, you know, they talk for a minute, then they go to the hospital to see Peter, uh, I think, right? Yeah. So that's the yeah. They they go to the hospital to get Peter or I can't remember now it's getting jumbly for me too. I can't remember. <laughs> at some point she's at the hospital. She goes to the elevator. This guy comes off of the elevator who's a lawyer friend of Peter's and he's like, "Oh, you're they and they hand her his effects." Mm-hmm. They're like, "Here's his his stuff." And the his key the keys to his apartment are in there. Right. Uh, so that was, which just allows her to get into the apartment. But the guy's like, oh, you're you're Peter's fiance. You know, oh, the guy's had a tough year, you know, with the accident and all. And she's like, accident? And he goes, and all of a sudden, he, just he like, gets so pissed. He's like, he's like, it was an accident. What did he tell you? He told you it was my fault? <laughs> we were, and then he gets, he does that thing where the guy, the actor that does it is is very good yeah. at this. He gets this straddle, like, like he's got, plants both feet in the ground. <laughs> and he, and he's like, we're playing basketball. And he's like g- gesturing wildly and everything. And uh, so he tells her a story. We find out later the whole story, but he tells her a story about how he had a pencil in his pocket when they were yeah. playing basketball. And apparently uh, Peter got stabbed through the testicle uh, through his seam because he's related <laughs> to me. So he also has a seam. And... Every guy has one, by the way. That was the joke that I think flew over your head. Oh. Is that every guy's testicles look like that. Okay. Uh, anyway. I don't really look that hard at testicles. Well, I, mean, I, I assume you've only saying. really seen mine, so. Um, sure. <laughs> keep, keep thinking that. So. <laughs> wow. That's very funny to you, huh? <laughs> so, um, he, he lost one of his testicles. Uh, and, and so she, she gets that little inside information, but uh, Jack and her go to Peter's apartment. And well, no, first she goes to Peter's apartment on her own. Yes, to feed the cat because she's going through his stuff and sees a can of cat food, and it's been several oh, days. That's right. And then Jack comes in. I don't even know why Jack was there. I don't know either, but that kind of that 
uh, lays credence to our idea that he's a little bit closer to Peter because he must have a key too. Right. So, yeah. yeah. And he knows that Peter doesn't have a cat. He knows stuff about, about Peter that, or about Peter that the rest of the family doesn't know. They are closer. That's why he's so suspicious. It makes sense. It's subtle. They don't, they don't come, they, they don't assume that the audience is dumb and say, hey, you know, here's why. They, they leave the subtle clues so you, yeah. can, so you can get there. I like that. But, uh, yes, she, like you said, she sees the cat food and everything. That litter box has got to be a wreck. Yeah. Oh, I don't even want to think. And, and I bet you, because, well, no, she has a cat. She probably took care of the litter box. She, she's oh, on it. Oh, I'm sure, yeah. But, uh. She's braving toxoplasmosis to, <laughs> to make sure that that cat has a comfortable place to shit. But, um. Yeah, he's he's like she's like I'm here to feed the cat. He's like he doesn't have a cat, and the cat walks up because the we cat, find out because, later because the cat is Ashley Bartlett Bacon's cat because the cat has an impeccable sense of cinematic time. Right? <laughs> he's like she doesn't have a cat. Cat's like oh that, that's my cue. Right? <laughs> cat walks around the corner, meow, <laughs> and then uh, the 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 mom cat is over there. <laughs> The stage mom cat is just off stage, like like nailed it, got it. <laughs> this cat's fluffy's gonna get so much work, right? You're our meal ticket. <laughs> and then, oh, we haven't even mentioned Joe Junior. Joe Junior. So in the apartment that she lives in, Joe Fusco. <laughs> <laughs> she lives above her landlord and his son, mm-hmm. who is single and has a thing for her. Oh yeah, he's ready to mingle. <laughs> single and ready to mingle yeah um he's ready to mingle with his sexuality trying on uh, female shoes right but yeah he's he is something else um <laughs> he's he first he has tickets to the ice capades yeah who goes it's, to the ice capades come on dude <laughs> it is not 1985 right and um, she never. Although he dresses like it's 1985. Yes, he does. She never agrees to go, but he acts like she did. Acts like she stood him up. He's really crazy. Don't he you is. think he's kind of yeah. crazy? A little bit, yeah. Well, he is a dude that owns a members only jacket. <laughs> he's the last member. Right. Um. So, okay. So her and Peter, like, I, I don't know exactly the order of events here, but. He sees her with Joe at some point. And Joe sees her with Peter at some point. And there's like this back and forth of like whether or not something's going on. Well, he comes up. So Jack comes up. He's going, going to the apartment. He's I think he's just like researching her. This is after they've been at Peter's apartment. Okay. And he goes to her apartment and he sees Joe. And he says, hey, uh, he's like, hey, I'm I, I'm the owner of the building. Right, which is a big ass lie. Well, he's a big liar. So yeah. and she said he says, oh, so you must know the person that lives in. And he knows her apartment number somehow. I don't know how he got this information. Well, remember, she wrote down her phone number and address for his mother. So he must have gotten it from That's, his mother. Oh, yeah. Yeah. This guy's a fucking like he's tenacious. He's a stalker. But so. He's she's like, oh yeah, Noah, I'm dating her. Yeah. He's like, oh okay. So then he thinks she's cheating. Yeah, he accuses her, and she's like, yeah, she's delusional. He also thinks he invented tinfoil. <laughs> <laughs> and so then, like the fam- the grandmother's getting upset because mm-hmm. he's accusing her in front of him, in front of the family, mm-hmm. and uh, she's like, if she could prove it, if she wanted to prove it, she could prove it. Mm-hmm. So she's like, uh, Peter only has one testicle. Yeah, and they're all kind of, this is a very funny scene, because they're all kind of looking at each other, and it's like Bill Pullman's looking at Peter Boyle, and Peter Boyle's looking at the mom, and, and they're all looking at each other, and Peter Boyle's like, ah, I don't have <laughs> And then finally, the mom goes, he's my, I'm his mother, I'll, I'll look, or whatever. What, the, if you had a son, I mean... Do no you, way. You think it'd be your place? And then, nope. Keep in mind, it's not to change his diaper. He's not a baby anymore. <laughs> right. This is a He's grown an ass adult man. man with an uncircumcised penis <laughs> and a seam up his up his <laughs> testicles. I don't know why that's the theme this week. But see, this is what happens when you drink. <laughs> right. Yeah, apparently, you become obsessed with balls I'm, and dick. I'm wow. <laughs> That's right. I'm very fun at parties. Um, 
<laughs> yeah, frat parties. I um, I I'm yeah, I'm very drunk. I'm like hugely uh, wasted <laughs> right now. But anyway, so yeah, I, I thought it was weird too. The dad should be the one doing it. Yeah. Not that not that the dad Mom. not that dad not that the dad would want to. Not that anyone wants to. I don't but, think any of them should have done it anyway. Yeah, it seems very... He's in a coma. Yeah. It's almost like molestation. They haven't it's, seen him in years. It seems fair. Now that I think about it, it's like they sexually assaulted him. Right? It's very questionable. <laughs> Let me just handle his fucking business while he's in a coma. The fuck? <laughs> but they verify that... A- you know, she is correct. So they assume then that she's had sex with him. Yeah, they assume she's been up close and personal to, uh, to Mr. Uh, you know, half house, <laughs> which, you know, this does come up later with uh, Saul who knows that she's lying. Right. And he's like, how did you know? I don't want to know. Like you said, I thought that was the best way to put it. Carol says, <laughs> I would be desperate to explain. <laughs> right. <laughs> She's just gonna let him think that she's a dirty, dirty birdie. Apparently, yeah. <sighs> so, okay. Jack shows up at her apartment immediately after Saul. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it was when really they have weird. that conversation. Um, and he's brought furniture, a wedding gift from his parents. Mm-hmm. And she's got Cho Jr. hidden in her closet. Why? I don't know. Because she doesn't want Jack to see him there. I guess, but he's trying on her shoes, yeah. FYI, and um, <laughs> she just takes off. She's like, let's let's take it to Peter's apartment. I'll go with you. Mm-hmm. And so this is when they really, like, kind of get to know each other. Yeah. And um, they they knock over a vase on his carpet and stain it blue, like, because he's such a, this guy is such a... Anal? What's the... Uh, narcissist. Okay. And everything in his life is, like, impeccably perfect. His apartment is, you know, all modern, sleek, mm-hmm. white everywhere. Oh, yeah. And then, like, in his in his wallet, he has pictures of himself, and he has framed pictures of himself as an apartment. Yeah. It's no good. No, not at all. <laughs> no bueno. I mean, right there, she should figure out he's an asshole. I mean, she knows nothing about him. Except right. that his family is nice, and he she thinks he's cute. Right. Anyway. A lot of times, that's enough. And, um, but here's the thing. He's a fantasy. That yeah. is honestly enough for a fantasy. Once you get to know somebody, then the fantasy breaks. You right. know, If you want to be with someone in reality, it's a lot harder than oh, just yeah. fantasizing. So her and Jack, they uh, she's going to walk home and he walks with her. Yeah. Because he gets blocked in and can't drive her back home. She told him not to park so close. And he did, but he was listen. like, "I've got to, you know, we got to get this out." So I got to. There was no one behind him. That's there's no reason he couldn't leave. the The rule of thumb is you should be able to see the bottom tires of the car in front of you. If you can see the bottom tires of the car in front of you, you have enough room to to maneuver around it. Well, that's good to know. Mm-hmm. I I'm really really bad at parallel parking, so yeah, I usually leave too much room. We don't have to do it that much though, where we live. There's not a in Chicago, in New York, and in some, we don't live in Detroit, so right. And even I, when we go to Detroit, there's not a lot of parallel parking. No, there's it's a lot of parking, parking garages, lots and garages. Yeah. yeah, there's a lot of you know, pay us uh, ten dollars to fucking park your car. You know where we do to do some parallel parking though is Royal Oak, and yes, Plymouth. True. Yep. Yeah. So, anyways, um, it's kind of like romantic. You can tell they're starting to like each other. They are walking through Chicago and talking she's about their life. Talking about how um, she used to plan trips with her dad, mm-hmm. and that, and he asked, "Where would you go if you could go anywhere?" And she wants to go to Venice. Yeah, and then she has a passport, Florence. Florence, yeah, and she has a passport with no stamps in it. Yeah, she carries it around with her. She's a dreamer, just like her dad. See, it makes it makes sense because her dad was this big romantic dreamer. And so is she. That's why she has fantasies about guys that she doesn't have the nerve to talk to and why she plans trips in her head that she doesn't have the nerve to take. Is it that she doesn't have the nerve or that she doesn't have the opportunity? I don't know. I mean, maybe both. I don't because 
the the trips that her dad took her on were like till Milwaukee and shit like <laughs> yeah. that from Indiana where they grew up. So right. where she grew up. So, you know, it's not like it's not like he went anywhere. It's not like he did anything huge either. Yeah. I mean, they, you know, they he made it as fun as possible. Maybe he also didn't have money or opportunity. Right. So, yeah, she's just a really sad person. Yeah. Um what where do we go after this? They go for their walk. They go for their walk and then I'm trying to remember what happens next. I think Lucy happens next. Yeah. Um, she Lucy is the younger sister, which I was thinking about this while we're watching it. Like she must be a late in life baby because the parents seem pretty old. Yeah, well she's I think she's probably about 15. Yeah, 14, 15. So, yeah, that they they want it's almost like my family then, I guess. Cuz yeah, they've got two grown men who have got to be in their late 20s, early 30s. No grandchildren yet though. Yeah. It's weird. But yeah, I would yeah, I would assume that I would assume yeah, there's probably like 15 years between her and her brothers. But it's a fucking long time. Yeah. But she is getting on the L with her friend, mm-hmm. and um, she lets them come in, and her coworker behind her is like, oh, who's this? And and then the girl's like, oh, she's marrying my brother. The coworker didn't know about the lie. Her boss knows, which right. is weird. But And he's telling Herman, you know, about it. Her- Herman? From oh. Herman's head. That, guy, <laughs> that guy's the boss, from the hard-ass boss from Herman's head. Right. So, yeah. So sadly canceled now. Her friend's like, you're, you're getting married. Oh, my gosh. And she's like, are you pregnant? <laughs> and she's like, yeah, I'm pregnant. Very, very sarcastically. But the young girl that's there and overhears it does not know that it's yeah, She has no, she, she needs a sarcasm sign. Right. Apparently. So she Jeez. tells everybody that Lucy's pregnant. Yeah. So now it's New Year's. Well, no, no, no. She doesn't tell everyone that Lucy's pregnant. Or, yeah. She tells Lucy that Sandra Bullock's pregnant. Wait. Wait. Or Lucy is the yeah. Sandra Bullock, isn't it? Yeah. What's the, the, the sister's name? I don't name? know. I thought it was Lucy, so obviously I have no idea. I don't know. Whatever. Anyways, now that everybody thinks she's pregnant. Mm-hmm. And when she tells the family, they're all freaking out, right? Jack just disappears. Yeah. And he has to go talk to her. Right. He's like, let me fucking talk about this. So he drives her, insists on driving her to the New Year's Eve party that yeah. she's going to, which right. is kind of creepy and stalkerish. And her, it's her work New Year's Eve party, so like all her coworkers and her boss and stuff are there. And um, but yeah, he just invites himself. Yeah, he says, "Oh, I'll drive you." She's like, "It's not that far." He drives her and then follows her in. <laughs> yeah, he's like, "I'm just allowed in too, right?" And so she goes to get a drink. And he's like, wait, that's that's spiked. And she's like, so? Mm -hmm. Or no, thank God, I think. And he's like, you shouldn't have it. Why not? And then everything gets super quiet. And he's like yelling over the music that's no longer there. Because it's not good for the baby. Mm -hmm. Tells all her friends that she's pregnant. Right. So she's understandably pissed. Mm -hmm. And he follows her again when she leaves. Like, he's just a stalker. He's like a puppy dog. And um like you ever see those those the cartoon with that one like small little puppy that follows the big puppy and it's like uh you know hey bill hey bill what are we going to do bill what are we going to do today but you know like Whoa. yeah okay. yeah okay. yeah <laughs> that's what he reminds me of yeah so she gets back to her apartment and joe junior's outside mm-hmm. with a bunch of people which do you stand outside in the middle of winter of course because I really don't. It seems a weird way to bring in the new year. He's barbecuing. Yeah. And uh, he's talking to her about why. Why She's like, why would you think I was with Joe? And he's doing this whole like, because they were leaning. <laughs> she's like, leaning? What's that? And this is like where they really have like a moment. Oh, yeah. You know, he's like, it's wanting and accepting. It's mm-hmm. leaning. And he and, does it. Yeah. And, like, they're, like, ready to, like, tear each other's clothes off <laughs> the way they're looking at each other. And Joe's like, uh, is he bothering you? It looks like he's uh, leaning. It's really funny. Funny, funny, funny. Yeah, it's very funny. Um, I don't know. Uh, yep. Then he wakes up. <laughs> <laughs> kind of like you just did. 
<laughs> I'm oh, really, that's right. really tired, guys. Uh, very good memory. <laughs> I have a fantastic. It is the vault, okay? It's all in the vault. Right. It, it never just gets, gets out. Shake around a little bit, and. Um, <laughs> That's right. You put everything in there and it's locked away, but it never gets out. The vault. That's a perfect, perfect metaphor for your memory. You're such an asshole. <laughs> so, yeah, Peter wakes up and he looks around at everybody. All the families there. All the the very nice camera work over all the faces. And then he like, it's almost like. In E.T. or something like that, where uh, you you pass by all the stuffed animals and you see E.T.'s in there, like this one doesn't right. belong, right? <laughs> and he kind of like the camera goes by everybody, and they like it passes by Lucy, and then he goes back, and he's like, "Who are you?" <laughs> <laughs> so they say, you know, uh, Jack Warden Saul is supposed to because he's woke, woken up. She talks to him, and he's like, "I'll." I'll make sure everything's okay. Uh, I just got to go. <laughs> and he disappears. Um, and so, you know, they're like, it's your fiance. And they're like, oh, he's got amnesia. They just assume yeah. he has amnesia. And she looks so relieved when they say it. And I think that is such a dick move on her part. Yeah. She should have immediately been like, no, listen. Yeah. She should have came. Yeah, she should have came forward right there. Yeah. But she saw the runtime and she was like, oh, it's not time yet. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah so now we've got him awake thinking he has amnesia and ashley bartlett bacon <laughs> oh yeah who's been calling yeah uh, this whole time she's like she calls and she's like i've been thinking about uh you know what you said and oh what the hell or what the hey i will marry you yeah what a great acceptance of a proposal to an answer to an machine. answering machine yeah it's insane so, yeah, she resurfaces and <laughs> what? Like a fucking uh, creature from the Black Lagoon. Right? She resurfaces. Um, yeah, they he, they break up. Like, she comes, she tracks him down to the hospital and mm-hmm. she's like, asshole, you're engaged because, like, the doorman told her or something? Mm-hmm. Yeah. How'd she know he was in the hospital, though? Oh, probably the doorman. Yeah. The doorman. <laughs> the second plot lord of the movie. Off screen, though. Right. <laughs> and, um, okay, so they break up, and then Saul decides to tell him to, instead of, you know, doing what he's supposed to do right. and tell the truth, he encourages him to propose to her yeah. again. Why don't Why don't you make her lie a truth? That's right. what he says, basically. Yeah, he's like, just talk to her. Well, you know what I think maybe he was thinking? Because he says, just talk to her, and if you don't see in a couple minutes what you know we all saw in seconds, then break up with her. Mm-hmm. But if you do, then ask her to marry you. I think maybe he's thinking he'll break up with her, and then it'll be okay. Maybe. Maybe. But he goes the other way. Yeah. He's like, my family loves you. I might as well love you. Yeah. The most romantic proposal ever. Right. It's actually a really good speech up yeah. until that point, because he's like, uh, he says like, it took a coma to wake me up <laughs> and all this stuff. He does seem like he comes back a better person. Yeah. Yeah. I think he'll be changed and better. So he says, yeah, he's like, he proposes. She accepts Bill Paxson comes and sees her or Bill Pullman. No, Bill pa- Pullman, Paxson, somebody. Bill, Bill Paxson makes a Jack. Cam- Bill Paxson makes a cameo in the movie. <laughs> says, I'm not Bill Pullman. Everyone and then leaves. No, Bill Pullman uh, comes to her and says, congratulations, all this stuff. And she's like, hey, is, you, can you think of any reason why I shouldn't marry Peter, basically? And he Unfair. says, yeah, he says no. He, no, he doesn't say no. He says, I can't. Yeah, I can't. Yeah. Yeah. Very pointedly, because he's thinking to himself, you know, he's got to put his own happiness on the back burner. And that's, you know, it's. It's their, you know, happiness that's important. Which she should really know about him. I mean, it's one of his nicer qualities is mm-hmm. that he's so selfless. But, like, he's having trouble. It's kind of the, one of the background things going on, getting out of the family business because mm-hmm. he doesn't want to disappoint his dad. So he's putting his happiness on the back burner there, too. Yeah, he has a hard time just saying what he wants. And, and I, maybe that's the thing that he learns in this movie. Yeah. 
But anyway, so they're about to get married. She in the hospital. Yeah, she like one day of being engaged. She, yeah, exactly. It's insane. She she starts walking down the aisle, takes her mom <laughs> mom uh, motions to her that she still has her coat on, takes yeah. her coat off, starts run, walking down the aisle again, and then uh, the the priest gets like a word out, and she goes, "I object." Mm-hmm. And then she gives the speech, basically. Well, wait, she objects, and then Jack says, "I would have to object too." Mm-hmm. And then. Uh, Bartlett comes in, Bacon comes in. And says so oh, she actually, objects. Yeah, this is actually after her speech, though. Okay. But, but yeah, she gives a speech, says, look, I'm not, I never knew him. I saved his life, but I never knew him before then, and explains basically all this stuff, you know. Well, she starts out by saying, I'm in love with your son. Yeah. To the family. To the, the other one. The other son, yeah. And then she talks about, very, this is a very funny moment, she's like, uh, She's like, you know, um, and then I fell in love with you. And Peter Boyle goes, because she's looking at him. He goes, me? <laughs> she <laughs> laughs. And she goes, no, well, yeah, all of you. you know? And she's like, you know, I haven't had a family in a really long time. And it was nice and all yeah. that stuff and everything. Um, it makes me cry a little bit. So she, um, you know, she basically says sorry. And, you know, she, she walks out. And... They're all like kind of left dumbstruck. Then she's back at her job. It's apparently her last day. They never explain why, why no. she's quitting or what she's doing or anything. I think, I think though, like she was making some changes because she, you know, she was unhappy in the job. She talked about how she mm-hmm. just sits there like a veal all day. Right. So, I mean, I think she was going to make some changes to make her life better. Yeah. So, uh, Jack shows up and with the whole family, right, and puts a a well, engagement ring instead of a what a token in, you know, and they you know they talk and everything, and then they kiss, you know. He she's he's like you know marry me, and she goes yeah, you know, and everything, and they kiss and stuff. So it's a it's a happy ending. That's real fast too. They've known each other a week. Yeah, very fast. But uh, you know, and then it ends with her narration. She talks about how. You know, they he they he took her to to Florence for their honeymoon, and um, you know, like uh, then she, you know, she gives it's it's the perfect it's a perfect roll credit situation because she says uh, Peter once asked me when I Jack and I fell in love. And I told him it was while you were sleeping. And then it's credits. I kind of hate that. That's like the one thing in the whole movie that bothers me. But it's, it's, she's saying the name of the movie and then they roll the credits yeah. immediately. It's, it's perfect. It's corny. Eh. And like, that's not obviously not what he meant. He knows it was when he was in a coma, which is not the same as being asleep. Right. <laughs> And, uh, yeah, I don't know. It just bugs me. So it bu- bugs you on a scientific, uh, biologically, I Lucy, think he wants to know, wrong. like, what was happening, like, more context. Like, at what point in <laughs> your story did you realize that you loved him? I kind of want to know that, too. <laughs> but we saw that. Basically, she should have just said, watch the movie while you were sleeping, <laughs> and you'll figure it out, Peter, you fucking dumbass. I got a question, though. How much money did Peter Gabriel make for this movie that he was barely in? That's what I want to know. Right. What? What's your um, question? Do you think when he woke up, if instead of going along with the amnesia thing, if she'd fessed up then, do you think everyone would have been okay with it? Do you think they would have forgiven her? Eventually. You don't think so? I don't know. I think so. Um, I was just curious what your take was. And... You know, like, Jack, when she's talking at, during the wedding and she's, you know, he, like, kind of mouthed her, like, why didn't you tell me? So, I get the impression that at any point, if she told him, he would have been okay with it. He probably would have been relieved and happy. Well, not at any point, but after he fell in love with yeah. her. After the leaning, <laughs> he would have been okay with it. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, but that was the movie. Uh, I enjoyed it a lot. Mm-hmm. Very good movie. One of the hard things about romantic comedies, which I, I, I think we can all agree this is a, uh, you know, a very standard romantic comedy. Yeah. Uh, one of the hard things about romantic comedies, like action movies, is, and even more than action movies, really, is it's a format or a genre that's 
very formulaic. There's not much you can do with a rom-com. It's, it's, you know, it's very paint by numbers. There's one person and there's another person and the one person needs to get with the other person at the end of the movie. That's the climax of the movie. And then there's, there's, um, you know, obstacles in the way and stuff like that. There's only so many things you can do. You can have it end unhappily, <laughs> you know, where they don't end up getting together. And it's like a tragedy. Basically you can like Romeo and Juliet, you can have them end up together, you know, happy ending. Um, and, and there's a few, um, formation, a few different, uh, variations that you can do on it, but it's pretty formulaic. And because of that, there's a lot of bad rom-coms out there. And because of that, just like with action movies, the writing, because the concept can't carry the movie. Right. The concept, just like in an action movie, just like in a rom- rom-com, same thing. The concept is very basic and something that's almost cliche that's been around forever now. So the writing and the acting and the directing have to be impeccable. Like that you can't have a, a badly acted romantic oh, comedy. No. Or a badly written romantic comedy. It will just fail. Right. Or a badly directed romantic comedy. When they're really good, like this one is really, really good. Mm -hmm. It's because it's a success in all three levels, all three major levels of of movie making, where the script is excellent and the script is absolutely fantastic. Uh, The actors have great chemistry and are very good actors. You know, excellent uh, here. You know, Mm -hmm. they're they're right on top of it here. And the directing has to be really good. Directing, absolutely phenomenal uh, for this movie. So the fact that when when a a romantic comedy is good, it's really good. Like, you know, people did an excellent job on it. Yes. Uh, You know, like science fiction movies, horror movies, things like that. Those can be carried concept-wise. But um, romantic comedy, even dramas, you know. But... um, uh, I don't know about that. Romantic comedies, it's too hard. Dramas, I think, dramas probably have the most, uh, dramas and broad comedies probably have the most, uh, I would say the most potential to be carried along by a premise. Because you can go, story-wise, you can go in a lot of different directions in uh, a drama. And uh, comedies, you can go a lot of different directions there, too, like just a straight comedy. Because you can go really narrow focus like an absurdist comedy or satire or something like that. You can go really broad. You know, you can do a lot of, not that you couldn't be lazy and make a bad comedy. Any film can be bad, but I think it's easier to make a good drama. It's easier to make a good comedy because you can build a very, um, a very intriguing premise for okay. e- for either of those things. Uh, as far as a movie goes anyway, romantic comedy is very difficult to make a good one. And, they did. They knocked it out of the park. They did. It's it's a really good movie. I had heard in the trades, as they say, the trade papers, that both uh, Julia Roberts, veteran of romantic comedies, uh, and Demi Moore were up for this role. Sandra Bullock is a relative newcomer. Mm-hmm. Like you like you mentioned, we saw her in Speed. Uh, I I like Julia Roberts. She's good actress. I think Demi Moore is an even a, a better actress than than Julia Roberts. I don't think this movie works without Sandra Bullock. I mostly agree. I think Julia Roberts could have pulled it off. I still think it's better with Sandra Bullock. I think Julia Roberts through maybe through no fault of her own is too she's too polished looking. She's too you know, like she like she's too model looking. You know what I mean? Imagine her in the the phone booth. I can't imagine her daydreaming about Peter Gabriel. She okay. doesn't have Julia or uh, uh, Sandra Bullock has more of an girl next door, every type of girl look and personality to her than Julia Roberts does. I guess Julia Roberts has a princess look to me. Huh. And I don't mean that derogatorily. I mean, she would be the perfect actress to play a princess in a movie, I think. She is a very, like, regal, elegant type of persona. And Julie and uh, Sandra Bullock has more of a, you know, easygoing, everyday kind of girl persona. Yeah, 
Okay. To I me. I can see that. Uh, so I think that's I think that's one of the things. And she is charming as hell in this movie. Yeah. And she I, I think she carries the whole the whole movie from beginning to end. Like I said, a lot of great people in here. Jack Warden, uh Peter Boyle, who who I love. Uh, I think Bill Pullman's excellent, and I think Bill Pullman's chemistry with Sandra Bullock is, is excellent as well. Uh, the dude that plays uh, Joe Junior, I think, is very funny <laughs> and good, and he's got he's got a lot of good scenes. But she she's the linchpin to me. She carries the picture. It doesn't work without her. Yeah. Okay, I agree. But yeah, that's uh, that was the movie. I, I I give it very. I and I'm not the kind of guy that's like I love every romantic comedy or anything right like for that. sure. But uh, yeah, very excellent, excellent film. Just just a outstanding film. I recommend Guys, take everybody. Your girls. Yeah, everybody go out and see it. It's a great date movie. Uh, I would recommend everyone go out there and see it. Yep. But that uh, that is the show. For the day, so, uh, Carol, take so, us home. you know what you're supposed to do? Tell people about it and leave us stars and write us, and we will read your messages. Late fee, 1994 at AOL.com. All right, have a good day. Bye.